First of all, will nonviolence work psychologically after the summer of 1967? Many people feel that nonviolence as a strategy for social change was cremated in the flames of the urban riots of the last two years. They tell us that Negroes have only now begun to find their true manhood in violence that the riots prove not only that Negroes hate whites, but that compulsively they must destroy them. This bloodlust interpretation ignores one of the most striking features of the city riots. Violent they certainly were. But the violence to a startling degree was focused against property, rather than against people. There were very few cases of injury to persons, and the vast majority of the rioters were not involved at all in attacking people. The much publicized death toll that marked the riots and the many injuries were overwhelmingly inflicted on the rioters by the military. It is clear that the riots were exacerbated by police action that was designed to injure or even to kill people. As for the snipers, no accounts of the riots claim that more than one or two dozen people were involved in sniping. From the facts, an unmistakable pattern emerges. A handful of Negroes used gunfire substantially to intimidate, not to kill, and all of the other participants had a different target, property. I am aware that there are many who wince at a distinction between property and persons, who hold both sacrosanct. My views are not so rigid. A life is sacred. Property is intended to serve life, and no matter how much we surround it with rights and respect, it has no personal being. It is part of the earth man walks on. It is not man. The focus on property in the 1967 riots is not accidental. It is saying something. If hostility to whites is ever going to dominate a Negro's attitude and reach murderous proportions, surely it would be during a riot. But this rare opportunity for bloodletting was sublimated into arson or turned into a kind of stormy carnival of free merchandise distribution. Why did the rioters avoid personal attacks? The explanation can't be fear of retribution, because the physical risk incurred in the attacks on property were no less than for personal assaults. The military forces were treating acts of petty larceny as equal to murder. Far more rioters took chances with their own lives in their attacks on property than threaten the life of anyone else. Why were they so violent with property then? Because property represents a white power structure which they were attacking and trying to destroy. A curious proof of the symbolic aspect of the looting for some who took part in it is the fact that after the riots, Police received hundreds of calls from Negroes trying to return merchandise they had taken. Those people wanted the experience of taking, of redressing the power imbalance that property represents. Possession afterwards was secondary. A deeper level of hostility came out in arson, which was far more dangerous than the looting. But it, too, was a demonstration and a warning. It was directed against symbols of exploitation. 
and it was designed to express the depth of anger in the community. What does this restraint in the summer riots mean for our future strategy? If one can find a court of nonviolence toward persons even during the riots when emotions were exploding, it means that nonviolence should not be written off for the future as a force in Negro life. Many people believe that the urban Negro is too angry and too sophisticated to be nonviolent. Those same people dismiss the nonviolent marches in the South and try to describe them as processions of pious elderly ladies. The fact is that in all the marches we have organized, some men of very violent tendencies have been involved. It was routine for us to collect hundreds of knives from our own ranks before the demonstrations in case of momentary weakness. And in Chicago last year, we saw some of the most violent individuals accepting nonviolent discipline. Day after day during those Chicago marches, I walked in our lines and I never saw anyone retaliate with violence. There were lots of provocations, not only the screaming white hootlands lining the sidewalks, but also groups of Negro militants talking about guerrilla warfare. We had some gang leaders and members marching with us. I remember walking with the Blackstone Rangers while bottles were flying from the sidelines, and I saw their noses being broken and blood flowing from their wounds, and I saw them continue and not retaliate, not one of them with violence. I am convinced that even very violent temperaments can be channeled through nonviolent discipline if the movement is moving, if they can act constructively and express through an effective channel their very legitimate anger. But even if nonviolence can be valid psychologically, for the protesters who want change, is it going to be effective strategically against a government and a status quo that has so far resisted this summer's demands on the grounds that we must not reward rioters? Far from rewarding the rioters, far from even giving a hearing to their just and urgent demands, the administration has ignored its responsibility for the causes of the riots and instead has used the negative aspects of them to justify continued inaction on the underlying issues. The administration's only concrete response was to initiate a study and call for a day of prayer. As a minister, I take prayer too seriously to use it as an excuse for avoiding work and responsibility. When a government commands more wealth and power than has ever been known in the history of the world and offers no more than this, it is worse than blind. It is provocative. It is paradoxical but fair to say that Negro terrorism is incited less on ghetto street corners than in the halls of Congress. I intend to show that nonviolence will be effective, but not until it has achieved the massive dimensions, the discipline planning, and the intense commitment of a sustained direct action movement of civil disobedience on the national scale. The dispossessed of this nation, the poor, both white and Negro, live in a cruelly unjust society.